Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Electrician Live. And we've got a great show for you tonight. And we're going to look at everything to do with our thoughts. And when I say our thoughts, obviously, when I say our, we're talking about Jay Grunberg. So, Jay, welcome again. Uh, it feels good to be back, Paul. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna talk about something that uh, you're going to be able to give a lot of insight on based on your experience right now as a contractor. And I'm going to try to feed in some of my experience through the years and mentoring and, 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 and working with other contractors through the years as well as owning multiple electrical contracting businesses. And that's, we want to talk about electrical apprentices, helpers, whatever you want to call them. And different things like crew leaders and what makes a leader and other things. So we're going to have a really good discussion on this episode of Electrician Live. And we're going to talk about, again, electrical apprentices and all things revolving around electrical apprentices. But but as always, before we get started, we have to pay homage to the sponsor. And the sponsors for this episode are Electrician Pride for all of your T-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, stickers, bags, whatever you need. We got logos and all kinds of stuff. We got the Tesla stuff. Look at that. Mugs. There's a mug right there. Okay, so without further ado, let's hear this word from our sponsor, and we'll get this thing kicked off. Today's show is sponsored by electricianpride.com, your one-stop shop for electrician-specific T-shirts, hoodies, phone cases, mugs, die-cut stickers, leggings, and so much more. Featuring unique designs for electricians, journeymen, and master electricians, as well as electrical engineers and electrical inspectors. For more information on all the products that are available, visit us at www.electricianpride.com today. All right, we got that out of the way. Got to sell some goodies. So, all right, Jay, what we're going to talk about is apprentice um and i know that this kind of uh actually this this topic actually was one that you submitted in to discuss and people have listened to some of my shows before where i talk about what i do with helpers and apprentices through the years but uh what spawned you to 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 want to do an episode on apprentices and things like that i imagine you have quite a few so tell us let's uh before we get started kind of tell us what your thought process was yeah i have quite a few apprentices under under some crew lead guys right now and actually we're bringing in a few more apprentices as of recently just because of the growth that we're having that's covid has yeah super awesome the covid hasn't slowed us down at all so we're actually actually as of now we've been actually picking up a little more than we have in during the beginning of the covid now that everybody's kind of wanting to get back into the flow of things and have stuff done at their house, whether it's the kitchen remodel remodel, or bathroom or basement. So we're actually in the process of hiring electricians or electrical apprentices. So I figured why not come on and and share what I look at or what I look for in an apprentice. And then also when we have them, what are the key features that you look for or that you want to install into them? Because I'm sure that, you know, we've got plenty of listeners who are either own businesses uh, that are starting out and they're going to be hiring apprentices. They're going to need to understand some insight into it. Again, it's, that's always a scary thing for, for owner. You know, it's one thing for us to strap the tools on and, and start our business and it's just us doing it. Uh, and again, you're really at that point, you're working for the business. The business is not working for you. The moment that you start hiring people and expanding out there, then, you know, we always used to say if, if you have to take a vacation and the business has to stop, then you're working for the business. If you're able to go on a vacation or take some time off and your business is still going, then the business is working for you and you're starting to get a hold of the concept of the entrepreneurship spirit. And it doesn't say that you can't be a mom and pop one and twosie because we all have been there, okay? Um, but again... You know, it depends on your desire to, to grow. You're going to have to hire people. So we're going to cover some of those those things, obviously, today and, and, and kind of touch on them. But, again, I know there's people listening out there who are, are preparing for an exam, and they're going to either be an apprentice or they're going to be a helper or they're going to be a journeyman. And I would say, wouldn't you say, Jay, that the things that we're going to talk about here could easily be something that we would expect also in a journeyman, again, uh, learning the craft, 
and that type of thing. Some of these principles we're going to talk about. So, oh, exactly. Yeah. So, exactly. well, let's jump right in. So, the first first topic that we're going to talk about today and expand on is what makes a good apprentice. Okay. Um, you want to give me your some of your thoughts, and I'll tell you. I can tell you one sure. thing: a good apprentice to me <laughs> is one that shows up at work on time, and yep. you know and respects the fact that we get started at a certain time i want to get started so that's, right. <laughs> that's number one that makes a that's a good apprentice for me okay before i even taught him a thing <laughs> go ahead what do you think yeah and i i would even take it a step further with showing up to the interview a couple minutes early as well oh, yeah. whether that's whether that's interview at the shop or the coffee shop we tend to have people meet us um at a general location like a starbucks where we can sit down i can buy them a cup of coffee or hot chocolate, whatever they're wanting, and then kind of dig into what my expectations are of an electrical apprentice and what they're going to get from us. So I set that foundation before they even decide to commit to joining Wired Up. Uh, so, you know, I, I used to always say, my dad used to say this to me, and my dad don't, had owned businesses for years, and um, he helped me start my first business. Um, and he always said to me is, if you're on time, you're late. Yeah. That was the thing he used to always tell me. He said, if, 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 the, if the meeting's at 8 o'clock and you arrive at 8, you're late. And you're like, wait a minute. I got there at 8. You're not prepared. If you're an apprentice and you're going to go in and you want to wow me, you want a job with my company, I mean, I didn't solicit you to come you know, and say, oh, I want you. I put an ad out there, and now you have to come and, and convince me why I'm going to hire you. And... If you come rolling in there at 8 o'clock for an 8 o'clock meeting and you're not ready, you know, so be early, you know, be, be a little early, be prepared, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, I, I agree, um, definitely. What else do you think makes a, a good, you know, a good apprentice? So the, a couple of the key things that I look for in, in guys is their initiative in the beginning because it's a lot to take in. So sure. for us, we – we get someone on the job site and we're training, we're doing on the job training to where we still have a deadline, let's say for a basement project. We have two days to get it done. Mm -hmm. So when we bring them in on day one, we still have to keep up with the schedule. Um, at the end of the day two, it has to be completed. So whether that's working a little extra more, a little more hours, or that's maybe bringing in another guy that's seasoned to jump crews for a little bit because we know we're training up an apprentice. Um, it just takes a little bit of time for us away from the lead guys or crew leads or even the seasoned apprentices to, to teach this um, new apprentice. So what we look for for them is just taking that initiative. Are we are they standing around while we're talking? Are they kind of looking for things to do, scoping their, their visual? Are, are, are they looking at the whole room, let's say a bedroom, for example? Are they, are they scanning the room from where the door opens? Are, are, are they kind of looking around to see how many boxes are going to put up? What are, what, what are they doing while they're standing around? Are they coming to ask what they can do again? Because there's, there's a certain time where you have to turn your back to them and maybe they get maybe they stop or they freeze because they don't know what to do. What's that, what's that old saying? You know, it's, it's how you do and what you do when people aren't watching. Yeah. That mean a lot. Okay. A lot. You know, the actions, you know, it's one way. And again, we see this in politics, which we will not talk politics here. We see a lot that when the camera's on, yeah. they're one way. When the camera's off, it's a different way. And, you know, right. high level of morals is what are you going to do when nobody's watching you? And so I always try to remember that. And we used to say that with emails too. Don't say something in an email that you would not say to their face because it will eventually make it to their face. I'm just saying. So somebody's going to share it. Okay. Or text message. Or text me. Oh, yeah. And you can't take them back. <laughs> I need one of those things, Jay, where I text it and it holds it for um, five minutes so that if I have texter's remorse, I can go, oh, delete, delete, delete. There's, probably, delete. An, there's an app five for that. Five minutes delay. Sure. Yeah. There's, there's, <laughs> yeah I, I constantly need to be on a delay. So, and so um, the other thing that I think about when I think about a, you know, a good apprentice is it makes me think of the initial process. So for your case, 
Do you hire people with absolutely zero experience? Do you, you know, that you, you hire? Because when I used to hire, a lot of the times I was focusing on vocational students. I was vo- vo- uh, graduates of vocational schools because I came from one. Uh, and I was kind of well known in the area. So when we would be picking them, um, we would have top pick of, of different things uh, and looking for people that had a little bit of an aptitude for it. Uh, do you do that, or did you just kind of like I run an ad, and if you come into me and you have absolutely zero experience, you, they can they can get a job with you and, and and start training with you? Yeah, so I do both actually. We uh, we put our guys through IEC school, which is a which is a schooling program here in Denver, and mm-hmm. they have a hiring list. So sometimes I'll scroll through that hiring list, I'll direct call people see what their interests are. Some of them are just commercial only, so I have to tell them it's, it wouldn't be a good fit with us since we're right. about 90% residential. Right. So I'll call these guys from the higher list, and actually I've had some of our best apprentices from that higher list. And the great thing about that is that they're already enrolled. They're already investing right. into their schooling. Right. So we offer schooling after the first year that, that the apprentice has been with us. We want to okay. make sure that you're sticking so that's that's one one way and then also i have done ads on indeed or craigslist and people call up they say hey man i i have no experience i just i just want to get my foot in the door and it's like well that's that's kind of what we want because i think that's one of our bullet points that we're going to talk about foot in the door too but but uh in a little bit but so you're open to you're open to giving them experience that's great a lot a lot of people are not a lot of people can't get past that hurdle of do you have any experience? And what do you sell, tell somebody if you have no experience? You, I have no experience. And all of a sudden, a lot of times the interview's over. Uh, we had a couple that worked for us that didn't have any experience, but I like to teach. So it knew that wouldn't be an issue. Um, but again, our first priority was to try to give the vocational students. We supported the vocational schools uh, in our area back in Charlottesville, Virginia. A big shout out to Charlottesville. Whoop, whoop. Um, you know, leave the statues up. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. Wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah. Not supposed to say anything. Anything about any of that. Okay. So anyway. So where was I? Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah. So sometimes we would hire that both. Uh, either. You know or. what's. You know what's funny is this. Is this morning I had an interview with two guys, and one was he had he had already re- registered himself with the IEC schooling the initiative. He had already registered. But we, but he found us on the Craigslist ad, and so did another guy who was pretty green. He worked for a commercial group for about or outfit for about three months, and then with the whole COVID thing, they just sunk. They tanked. So I had to reassure him, hey, during this whole COVID situation, we've been very fortunate. You're gonna have to work. Have we got work. Yeah. So come, come over here. So it was just a case where I had two different guys, exactly what you're talking about. One that had very little experience, and one that had no experience. But they also registered themselves in school. So I was very, very happy with the two guys, the two candidates. Yeah. I think ultimately, I think we both agree that a good apprentice is one that's just willing to get their own time, uh, be uh, open. Um, but I can also tell you this. i tell you what I – we'll probably talk about what to get you fired later, but I'm going to tell you right now, an apprentice that comes on and becomes a splinter that festers is not going to do very well. If you're an apprentice, here's some advice from an old guy who's owned many electrical companies. Come in, learn, and shut up, okay? Don't come in and start problems, rumors, causing problems with everybody on there. I I never played on my site. I didn't expect you to throw wire binding devices or wire nuts and shoot them through pecs or, you know, as you can see, it's happened. Um, I did not, you know, every time I saw staples laying all over the place, to me, that was money laying on the floor. But I set that tone early. Okay. So again, come and learn, shut up your opinion. I'll listen to it and I will understand it because sometimes outside sources bring in some ideas. But at the end of the day, when it time crunch, like, like Jay said, it's two days to get a job done. Quiet, do the job. Learn, okay? That's what I'm saying. What do you think? Oh, I think that's great. I think the opinions that they have, a lot of them, they try to come in 
trying to tweak your system and that's why I like them very new because we can train them in our own system the way we do it. So really their opinions, you, you may listen to them. We kind of in one ear out the other, if it even goes into one, it's like, Hey man, stay focused. Let's, let's focus on what we're training you to do right. as you continue to grow and you may become in a leadership role. You then can take what you've learned and kind of tweak a little bit, but still mm-hmm. stay within the same um, system that we. Absolutely. Know, so. That sounds a lot nicer than my way of saying it. <laughs> and he's not, he's a, he's the, he's the nicer of the two. All right. So next topic, let's move on to what do you do? Uh, what to do as a beginning apprentice? Mm. Tell me, what do you, what do you mean? What to do as a, what to do as a beginning apprentice? Um, yeah, so yeah, go ahead. What, what no, do you... it, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, as a, uh, as a beginning apprentice, you, you, you need to be a sponge. Yes. You need to be able to listen, especially if somebody is, uh, you know, has some years of experience. And again, this kind of tailors into a good apprentice, but, and I'm not sure if this is exactly where you were going. But, you know, as a beginning apprentice, you need to understand that in the electrical industry, we have customary fundamental processes we follow. From a, from a rough end or to a layout to a rough end to a trim to the final to – I mean, there's a process we follow. And so each one of them has their own little dance that you have to follow. Okay, of course, then you mix in inspections, okay, and then you mix in change orders. You mix in anything that somebody doesn't like. And, again, to me, a lot of people gripe about changing things, and I'm like, cha-ching. You know, I don't have a problem doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, It'll you want to change money. it. Yeah, I mean, you want to change it, but at the end of the day, um, the beginning apprentice, um, you know, when they used to come to my company, I always would set them up with tools. I, I'd always, believe it or not, I would actually go over each tool with the apprentice. I would explain to them side cutters, diagonals. I would explain to them why we have each one of these tools, and I would make it a point each time we would use it. And you could hear me on job sites all the time. And I had guys with me, but I was always teaching, as you can imagine. I'd be over in the, on one side of the building. I'm using a side cutter, and I'd yell, Johnny, side cutters, this is what we're doing. I'm going to cut this. And, you know, and, and I said, that's what you use your side cutters for. And so I was always yelling it out and teaching, laying out the room, uh, showing them why we did it. And, and believe it or not, I'd go to another room, and I'd say, okay, it's your turn. And I wanted to see how well they retained what I explained to them. And it's okay if it was early on and they were like, oh, because they could be nervous. But you'd be surprised. A lot of the ones that have the initiative will just grab that. And we were talking one other time. Jay them use their hammers for their height and size, for their boxes and things like that. And they stay very consistent. Uh, when I do it, I used to have a measuring tape or a dowel with certain markings on it at certain heights. And I would always give one to all of our uh, electricians, and we would make it, it would be real fancy. We'd have the different colored tapes at the different heights, and it would be in their truck, and it had a little bracket it would mount on, and kind of, you know, I had a guy with us for years that would have his stick for years. You know, it's kind of like that, you know, college or paddle or whatnot, but it was our thing. And it had the different heights so that you couldn't, if I wanted certain things to be at certain heights, you had no excuse, okay, because you had your stick. You had your dowel with your markings on it, and it was marked on it at certain height, countertop height, things like that, receptacle height. Uh, it had adjustments on it, whether or not we knew that it was going to have hardwood floor with a one-inch hardwood floor so that we have our overall above the finished level. You know, we, we had these markings on it, and I would show them how to use all this, but then I would test them constantly. I'd say, you know, go in the bedroom, uh, pretty easy layout, you know, six, you know, six and twelve, um, and and I would even draw it for them on a on a drawing, just to draw the room, and I'd say, okay, think about the spacing, think about optimization of the spacing. Why would you put a receptacle behind the door if it's a three foot door? Just move it out a little bit past the door, because nobody's going to put anything behind the door. So what's the point of the receptacle? You can go up to six feet. So think about your layout. And then the other thing was, if I'm laying it out and it looks really awkward, if you're the electrical contractor that's trying to save one box, or you're wanting for a good layout, and I was always that way. I didn't, look, I priced a job, uh, I think you price it per box and per the device, you know, work it out that way. 
I always bid my stuff. So I had enough factor in there that I was like, no, I'm laying it out the way I want it. I'm, I'm not going to chinch on the boxes and have one box awkward than the other just because of a spacing, you know, rules. Sure. So that's how I taught it. Um, so so that my spacing, doing a, you would bid doing like a base bid, a yeah, total price for everything? I did, I did total price in whether it's a finished basement finishing off basement or houses. I, again, I, I think I probably said in another episode, I used to do multi-million dollar houses. And I would, I would do everything. Now, back in the day, I used Conest. And I had oh, Conest yeah. worked up so that I knew what I was putting in there. And I used national pricing. Um, now, there's a, there's a program out there called Best Bid Hybrid Pro, which has a residential module. Oh, my God. That is the easiest software to use, and you can literally draw on a blueprint. You take a picture of the blueprint, of the house blueprint, and you load it into the thing, and you can lay it out on the screen, and it'll add everything up and price it. And so it's pretty neat software. But um, at the end of the day, some things I was good at. You know, I'd done, I did a lot of the, 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 the spec houses. If you've done one, you've done a dozen. So you get a contractor who says, hey, I've got 30 of these spec houses. They're 2,500 square foot or 3,000 square foot or whatever it is. I want them all the same. Well, you do one and you price it up. Then you might, unless something changed in your pricing, copper changes, things like that. Um, we always bought our wire in bulk anyway, so on pallets. So we get it at a deal and that was it. So I don't know. I'm bogarting the topic. But again, that's the kind of stuff we did with the beginning apprentice. Okay, Jay. What do you do with your beginning apprentices? Oh, it's the same concept as, as what you just went over. Is we, we get them into a bedroom, a simple layout of a bedroom, do the six, 12-foot rule, you know, and then if there's a space two feet or greater, we put one there, obviously. And then we teach them how to number. After they've learned the box heights and how many needs to go in there. And, and again, there's beds, of course, so there's beds. So you're going to put one to the left and then one to the right. We tend to, I don't want to say overbox, but again, if the spacing looks weird, then we'll we'll give the customer an option because they walk with us in the beginning. Okay. We walk with the customer and the general contractor, and we mark down what they want. Because one thing about bidding, you guys, is is you're going to bid a project per the plan. Nine out of ten times, there's going to be changes. Oh yeah, there's going to be changes because you come in and, and you give them the option of a four way or three way or a TV outlet up high, receptacle up high, receptacle down low, just those type of options. So but for our apprentices, we teach them the basic six, 12 foot rule. And then we, we mount them, we mount the switches at 48 to the top. We start marking. So a lot of times in our bedrooms, we put a bedroom circuit just for that bedroom. And we might hit maybe a hallway receptacle if it's right on the opposite side of that wall, but we'll do a home run into the switch box. So we'll go home run one. And then we'll put a one at that box and then two at that receptacle down low, three, four. And then we'll get to about eight or nine and go EOC, which is end of circuit. And we say, okay, drill your holes, you know, waist level. Whenever you get to a box, maybe have that length, 12 inches, 18 inches, whatever it is. You got to find that happy, sure. happy length as, as they're going. So we, we teach them the basics of boxing out and good apprentices will we'll ask questions as they go. Hey, why is this? Why is that? And again, it, we're under a time crunch, so we don't give really code references right at that time. But as they learn and grow into becoming leaders, they'll, they'll know where to find it in the code. Sure. And, and if that's the same time you start introducing things like box fill, you know, ex explaining box fill, ceiling fan boxes, if they got to support a you know, ceiling fan, um, things like that. And some of the code changes, you know, if it could be a ceiling fan put there, now you're going to, you know, now you got to put a box in that's designed to support a ceiling fan. So a lot of changes. We, we would kind of, but through the years, we would just kind of walk through the room and don't expect them to remember everything. Sure. But it, I can always tell that the apprentice that was going to be the next potential leader is that apprentice that seemed to just know it. And I'd say, all right, what do you do now? We, we showed you another room. You did a room. And after about the first or second room, you go to another bedroom and I'll go, all right, do it. And then by the second bedroom, they've got it. They're like, oh, I got this. I can lay it out. You know, they're going to lay it, marking it with the with the stick or, or the ruler or whatever, and they're marking it off the the arrow it up so it meets this side of the box. And 
and, and all that kind of stuff. And then they go to the switch there and they say the way it is where it is the jam or whatever. And we have to stub it out a little bit. And they're like, oh, I need a I need a scab block. And I'm like, yeah. there you go. <laughs> all right. You're getting it. And then I could I could tell. But, you know, if you teach it right, apprentices will catch on pretty good. And then, of course, during that whole time, you occasionally might get that apprentice that just drags their feet, doesn't want to do it, gripes the whole time. They will not last long with me. Okay. So I'm like, don't drag your butt. Okay. I'm not here to be your babysitter. I'm here to to work you. All right. Good, good, good. So let's move on to the next topic. And that brings us to dragging your feet, the babysitter thing. I guess the things to do that will get you fired. And oh, I have man. talked about this a lot. So, Jay, let Don't us know up. what wired up. <laughs> Not show up. Yeah, that'll get you fired. Uh, tell us what I can do to get fired and wired up. Okay. So when you're when you're on a job with us, and there's a few things showing up late. That that's that's in the probation period. And even after the probation period, some guys slack off. They start thinking they got some seniority so they can show up late. We don't I'm friends with the boss. Yeah, we don't, we don't do that, man. You got to be on time. You got to show up. We got to be able to train you and get these jobs done. So showing up late is probably one of the biggest ones or no call, no shows where you're not communicating with anybody. We have a process where you got to get a hold of your crew lead and get a hold of the people in the office. So we both know what's going on and we can get you on the schedule for the next day or, the following day, whatever it is. Um, attitude. Attitude's a big one. You know, if you're a cancer, what I'd call cancer on the project, meaning... Have you listened to my uh, Have you listened to my podcast where I talk about removing the cancer from your company? I have. Okay. So I that have. was a good one where I went very deep in what it can do to your company, what it can do, and, and it's sometimes it's just time to just remove it. Get rid of the fat sometimes. Yeah. Get rid of it. Um, trim, trim that brisket lean. Sorry, that was my, that's that's my smoking uh, meat <laughs> reference for my grill. Sorry. So yeah, so trimming the fat, uh, you're just a cancer, cancer to the company. You're dragging it down. I hate rumors. I hate guys on site that will talk to the other guy and say something, something. Paul did something for so and so, so you know, but he didn't do it for us or whatever like that. I choose what I do for who I choose for what I do, and don't question my reasons. Okay, I'm the owner. That's the other thing I think people don't get. When they go to working for companies, and I see this all the time, and I see it a lot on Instagram, is you're working for somebody, and the camera's on them, and they're posting it on social media. God, that's a nice mug you got there. I'm just saying. So they post it on. Where can you get that mug, Jay? You can get that mug. At electricianpride.com. Right there you go. All right. <laughs> ChristianPride.com. So, there you go. So I see people posting things, and they're just ripping. A short story, I had a guy that came out to do HVAC work here. Still hadn't fixed my HVAC. My air conditioning unit still doesn't work. work crap. It's a train. Don't buy a train because it never runs. What do they say? Train always run? Not mine. Anyway, and it's new. I'm just saying. Okay. Yeah. All right, so... Anyway, I had him out there. Um, Jay, we're not going to get trained as a sponsor. I'm sorry. That's not going to happen now. But um, so I'm out, he comes out there, and the whole time he's here working on the, on the unit, he is bashing the crap out of his own company, the company he works for. Terrible. And, you know, and I'm sitting there listening to him as, a, as being an owner and, and, and mentoring, you know, business owners and things like that. And, and I'm listening to this, and he finishes, and we're leaving. And he, and, you know, he's just—he doesn't look the part. He doesn't dress. You've heard me talk about. It. I'm a believer. All my guys, I made sure they had company shirts. I, I supplied the boots if they needed it. If they didn't, they do whatever they want. But I, I believe that you you look a certain way. That's why I've always been big on logos and and, and everything. Is you, you you carry your part for your company. Okay, you could be four people. But you can look like you're a thousand people, right? And it sends a message. To, so anyway, he was just trashing. And I said, and he was done. And I said, you know, does your owner know that you hate working for him so bad? What do you mean? I don't hate working for him. I said, well, if you listen to the way you talk, you literally hate the guy or you hate the company. 
because you seem miserable. And I know it's none of my business, and you know, but you know, I would think about it. You know, obviously he pays you a paycheck, and nobody's holding a knife to your neck. You can leave any time. You choose to be there. You choose to work there. Act like it. Come and do your job. Get it done and go home. And what do you want to do after your hours? Do do your thing. Yeah. But that's the other biggest thing. I um, if I ever had an employee that did that and I find out about it, they would not be with me long. Remember what I told you before we started tonight? We had a conversation and I said, I give somebody 100% of my respect until they take it away by some stupid action. Earning the respect from me back is a hard thing to get. So you start out with 100% of it. You take it away by doing something stupid, affecting me, my company, our reputation, then you erode it away. It's very hard for you to get that back. And don't expect me to say, oops, people make mistakes. Whatever comes out of your mouth, remember, it should not affect my company. And you don't have any reason to, 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 to say anything negative about me unless you plan on leaving and then leave, right? God, I sound harsh tonight, Jay. I, I, I think the concept that these guys come in with too is, is the basic concept of, I'm on a construction site. I can do what I want, say what I want, when I want, how I want to say it. And it's the total opposite. Mm-hmm. Maybe if you're in a commercial building and there's not. I don't know. I don't know. I'm in a commercial building. You know, you don't know then, who's there, yeah, right? Exactly. And they're an extension of my company. And Well, I'm, say, I'm saying like where, where, where people do it the most, I would say, is, well, no, because we have guys that, that are in basements with us, maybe other trades that bring up topics that we – we stay away from. I mean, in our in my interview this morning, I stay away from certain topics um, and and certain politics, whether it's politics or the sexual harassment um, topics or just down talking, like you were saying, your company or bringing your outside work into the workplace. That's a big mm-hmm. one too. You can just throw yourself under the bus. Um, so really, you you just have to be professional when you're wearing this logo on your. On, on, on the person, you're representing us, a, a company that I've built from the ground up, something mm-hmm. that I take a lot of pride into. So, and, and we've invested in you guys. We're, we're, we want the best out of you guys. We want you guys to come up as apprentices, good apprentices. We want you guys to be good crew leaders and potentially RWs, journeymen, masters. So really the opportunity is up to you and, and how you take it. But as sure. far as the foul language coming in, maybe smelling like liquor oh, from the night yeah. before. I'll or pot, or, or pot, pot, you know, something like that. You know, people say, "Well, I can do what I used to get from the employees because I had a drug testing program." And people say, "What I do on my own time is none of your business." I'm like, it becomes my business when it when you're on my time. If you're yep. driving my truck, so you're putting anybody a helper that's riding with you or whatever. If you're putting them in harm's way, then it's affecting me, and. I don't want it to affect the work that gets done. So, again, I don't care what people do with their own personal time, but on my time, when you're working for me, it wasn't something that I did. Now, I know I'm a, we're going to get a bunch of the... Uh, I'm going to get the haters, Jay. I got my haters out there. They're going to say, God, Same. I'm glad I didn't work for you, Paul. Well, you didn't work for me. And I wasn't the easiest to work for, so I acknowledge that. My wife would acknowledge that. My brother would acknowledge that. That wasn't the easiest to work for. But I guaranteed you you were going to become a good electrician. You were going to learn how to do the work. Okay? So, did you ever Did you ever have apprentices that you would you would provide them the tools? Well, see, this is – I gave is all my apprentices tools. Between us is, is I require them to have their own tools or the basic set of tools, which are you know, the, the Romex strippers. Ooh. Um, probably the – you mean uh, the non non metallic sheath cable strippers? Oh yes, the NMB yeah. strippers. Yes, oh, okay, I that's better. NMB. Are we doing code tonight? I, I apologize. <laughs> got no, it was it was it's the manufacturer trade name of a non metallic sheath cable that you utilized that we're going to. We'll forget that one. Yeah. The street slang. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, we're, we won't rewind that one. But, but so, God, it's 
cricket's been <laughs> forever, man. It's like so there's there's certain tools that I require these guys to have the the ground crimpers, whether yeah. they're a, a particular one or I have the one on my clients that that I use that in the center they have the ground crimp, um, yeah. eleven and one, or an eight and one. That's if they your favorite donate. tool, by the way. Eleven and one is Jay's. Jay's gotta have in the middle of an apocalypse. That is the one to, of course, I want an AR-15, but he wants his 11 and one I'm just saying that's, yeah. Hey, I can pry into doors with it. I can get cans opened with it. I can I can do a lot of stuff with it. So I can, I can even stab someone with it. <laughs> it's, it's necessary. But, uh, All right. I show these guys the tools, and, and then I require them to have certain tools on the job site when they get there the first few days or, you know, within a week, and, I always tell them, take a look at your other guys' tools around you and start um, deciding what tools you want to invest in. And that's another good quality about the good apprentices and, and the guys that are listening that if you can take a little bit of money, 20 bucks out of every check and just put it aside and put it aside. And then when you get enough to maybe get that NMB strippers or an 11 one or maybe a, a tester, some type of tool that, that you're investing in yourself that's what really that's a sign that that shows a good apprentice to me is when you're investing into yourself and into the trade yeah so when we gave we supplied the tools uh it, it wasn't supplying the tools that they didn't pay for them it was it would come out of their it, it would come out of their pay oh gotcha but gotcha. we supplied the tools because we had certain ones that we wanted you know to have in the, in the complete kit and really it was almost it, it was everything was at cost. But they it would come out of their it would come out of their pay that was their tools, um, and then of course when they left they could take if they left they could take their tools, but we would have an inf- inventory list of obviously we, every one of them had it so when they left all they had to do is you know we had a, we have uh, unless they just quit or something they had, we would have an exit interview, and the exit usually with Bobby who worked for me Bobby would do the exit interviews. And they would go over and say, "Okay, these are the tools. You know, these are your tools. This is what we had originally in the in the in the kit." And obviously, they've been there for a while. They've added extra ones that they bought. Uh, but we would always buy them if they couldn't afford them. Uh, like some of the ratchets, we had them on the trucks. But if there was something they wanted they couldn't afford, we would buy it and we would stretch it out in paychecks so they don't have to you know pay it all at one time. Usually, small tools it wasn't that big a deal. That type of thing, right? So yeah. anyway, so that's you know that's how we that's how we would do it. Did I move? Did I act like I was yelling at something? Sorry, <laughs> Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, I've, I've actually done that with a few guys too, who've been with us for maybe over a year or so, and they want to get that eighteen bolt Milwaukee. Woohoo! I would make sure that it was Milwaukee. Did you get any? Uh, did you get no. else? No. Oh no. Okay. Okay. No. Sorry. No. I'll try harder. Sorry. You you have to buy your own Milwaukee's right now. <laughs> we, you know. <laughs> All right. But I so. buy them. I buy them the, the the Milwaukee 18 volt set because maybe they. I don't know. Maybe they don't put away the money like they should. But I also see the progress in them, and sure. I would do the same thing. I'd take a certain amount out of their checks. I try to stay away from that, though. I now, do try to stay away from that. At Christmas time, I was always very generous with the power tools. So, you know, and it oh, would be there. It would be there, deals. so. Great deals. Great deals for apprentices on, on Thanksgiving, uh, Black Friday, mm-hmm. and Christmas. You go to Home Depot or Lowe's. I usually go to Home Depot. Um, great deals. That's where you're going to get the best deals, the best bang for your bucks when it comes to especially um, battery-operated tools. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can get those. Sometimes they'll have a two for, you know, obviously the brand that I like. Don't they give those away? I think they, they give them to you. <laughs> they get, that's right. When I walk into Home Depot, they go, look, it's Mr. Abernathy. Here, have a tool. <laughs> anyway, no, so, okay, so fired. Right, I'll, I'll, <laughs> shh. All right, so, so. I, I was surprised. Any. I was surprised how many people though were interested in going to Harbor Freight after our oh, yeah. last 
last week's um, show. It was amazing. Great. I had, a, 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 you know, Rombo picked up the um, the Rombo. Ames, um, yes. picked up the Ames um, uh, voltmeter. And, and, you know, amp probe, voltmeter, clamp on amp, hertz, and it, it, capacitor. It does everything. And, you know, actually used it today, but that's a different story. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's a nice, true RMS. So, and I've still got my, I still have my flukes, and it's not a true RMS. So, I need to do an episode maybe on how to find harmonics in a commercial building using a true RMS and a non-true RMS, because there's a formula that you can do to tell whether or not you have harmonics. And maybe that a little too technical, but that's old school, and uh, that's the engineering part of me. Who, how I can tell the harmonics in a building using a formula based on the readings I get from a true RMS versus a, a standard uh, meter. And my Fluke is a standard. My Ames is a true RMS. So you, you can do that, clamping on. Anyway, another topic. Anyway, he, he did. He go he went and picked them, picked them up. Um, and so, I mean, there's some great things there, you know. So I don't know. I don't know. It's good stuff. They're not a sponsor, but hey. All right, so that's enough. I was going to tell you a quick story on, the, on, the, on the, the last guy that I fired. And I don't fire a lot of people. I'm not a, I wasn't a fiery kind of boss, you know, but if you got under my skin. Um, I was more make it so difficult for you that you would quit kind of boss. Yeah. Okay, I hate to say that. I feel so dirty now. But, I, you know, it was easier because then I wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have to pay unemployment, and I wouldn't have to pay anything because I just made you miserable and you quit. God, does that sound bad? Does that do I? Oh. <laughs> we actually have it, huh? We actually have it in our um, our book that you can voluntarily leave when you want, and we can voluntarily get rid of you when when you want, and you can't collect unemployment. Oh, okay. Cool. That's that's actually something that you initial and you know right up the right out of the gate. So okay. All right, so anyway, the story was I had this big multi-million dollar house that we were wiring because I had a future promise to get this building developer who was doing an entire subdivision of 200-plus homes, and it was all going to be mine, Jay. Mm. And that would have kept us very busy for quite a while, okay? Um, and so, again, with amongst the other work, service work, but that, was, that, would, have been, that would have been great. So... I was doing his house, and he's the developer, and he's a multi-million dollar developer. Uh, this was back in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And um, it was called Preston Lake. And they were doing it, and his, um, we were wiring it, and the guy was putting in the light sconces in the stairwell. And I don't know what I was. I think it was out of town teaching for Eaton Cutler Hammer because I helped start their ECCN program, helped create that and start teaching it around the country. And I was traveling somewhere, and I, you know, and I came back, and I, and I ended up surprising at the job site, and came out there. I was there for the rough end, but this was for the final. We were putting in the you know, the, the luminaires and things, the sconces were in the. And I noticed in there, and I went into there, and it's again multi million dollar house, and there's handprints all down the the wall. Luminaires were all crooked. It just, it just looked, they weren't tight. I mean, it just it, it just looked terrible. And I asked him, I, you know, I said to him, I said, what are you doing? Um, you know what pro- process that we have when it comes to, to hanging the, the luminaires at the end and, and fingerprints and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, I don't worry about that. I can't see it from my house. And uh, that's all it took. I must have already been in a bad mood. But not to be, be honest with you, I'd already had other issues with him. And, and sadly, he was my lead. You know, he was the master for that project. And he said, I can't see it from my house to me, the owner. And, you know, and I looked at him, I said, sure you can, because that's where you're going, to your house. And so I said, give the keys to the van to your helper. They can take it back. You call somebody to come get you. You don't finish the rest of the day. You're no. done. And I called Bobby and said, Bobby, put together exit package you know, or what, what, you know, put together the, what tools are ours and theirs, you know, that's like I said, he's gone. And Bobby always used to say, Bobby was a big dude, big, Bobby was like 350 pounds. And Bobby's like, whatever boss, whatever you want, I'll take care of it. I'm like, 
I don't want him back on this project, Bobby. And is that your security guard? That was my man. He he, he, man, he dude would do muscle. anything I tell him to do. But he was he was a really good guy. That's awesome. Um, you know, certain things you wouldn't do with Bobby. I could not send Bobby in the attics. I could, yeah. I could not. I couldn't send him in crawl spaces because he would get yeah. stuck. But uh, but for everything else, he was he was a good helping administrate policies and things like that. Because I was like, you know, Bobby, take care of it. All right? and, and Bobby said, whatever you want, boss. So uh, so anyway, I fired that fired that guy, and it, it already had a history of issues, but. You don't. You just don't say that kind of crap to the owner, man. And and he cussed like a sailor. And the last thing that I needed on that project, and it just so happens he was the one I gave that project to. I, you know, that's a very volatile project, right? That that that's securing me a lot of work. And you know, and I there was other times I was out there that that, that I come up on the site or I wasn't doing a rough end when I was there with them laying everything out and doing what we're doing. That he was just a F this, F that, and the owners were there. And the owners were, you know, fairly religious, you know. And, uh, you know, they, they and it, you know, I could, you know, I had little kids running around on the project. Yeah. You know, it's their house. In fact, they had like 40 acres of, to just their house, not to mention the big area. It just wasn't going to work. And I told him over and over again, look, not on this job. You're not going to do it. And he would constantly give me problems. So it was the last straw. I come back, and that's what I saw. And I was like, no. I spent a lot of money in putting and getting the um, nitrile gloves. Oh, sure. That they use when they're hanging the uh, wall fixtures, uh, luminaires, in certain areas, and, and or cleaning products that I'd give them. And he didn't care. So I fired him. Um, but that, that's the kind of stuff that tells me he was ready to go. He wanted to leave. He, he just didn't care. You don't say that to the owner. Which, which again, brings me to another question, um, whether we'll get through all these topics here tonight, is how close do you get to your employees? Now, when I tell owners and I talk to them and I mentor them and I talk about, I take my personal stuff out of it and talk about you know business mentoring, and I go, don't get too close. You have to create a distance. Because the closer you get, the more apt you are to have to be taken advantage of. And I always created that separation, right? We go, you know, all everybody go bowling together, have a night where we would pay for it or have a party. I think you got one coming up. Uh, different things. But I made sure that there was always that line, that, that there's the line between the boss and the owner. And even me and Bobby didn't cross that line. Bobby knew who the boss was, right? Uh, he knew where his paycheck came from. But you still could have a good relationship. You still could, you know, joke and not be too, you know, rigid. But you, you do have to draw the line, that type of thing. You can't let them be late, like you said, and, and, and then they get away with it and somebody else sees it and then they do it and then he loses control. What do you th- what do you think about that? I mean, do you? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. How, what's your what's your thought on it? When when I'm when we first started, we had it was just me and a few guys, so we, I was out in the field a lot more than I am now. But as we've grown, I've been able to separate myself from a lot of the guys, especially the crew leads. Still, I, I still answer my phone calls to them, sure. but you do, like you said, you do have to have that barrier between you and them because they'll start i don't know taking taking advantage of you trying to get away with certain things and and what's sad is when your crew leads do it and they're showing the apprentices below them that it's okay to do and and it's trickle down yeah so yeah i I, but i'm also professional with them you know i'm always answering my phone calls their phone calls or i get back to them right away i might shoot them a text or an email we get together probably twice a year um, as far as a group as a company, but we have crew lead meetings once a month where I buy them breakfast. They come in on their own time in the morning, six. We sit down from like about six to seven, have some pancakes, talk about um, where we're going, the good and the bad things that happened this month, what we can improve on on the next month, how we can incorporate certain systems that guys are, or certain ideas that they have. So we're always trying to continue to grow. So you have to have, 
a little bit more in depth relationship, especially with the crew leads sure. than you do your apprentices. Sure. But that's because when I go home and I'm at my computer um, typing up different bids for more jobs to come, they're behind me doing the jobs that I already have going and right. they're completing them. I'm, I, I probably show up probably one out of every 20 jobs that we do okay. as far as the install. I might be on the pre-con, which is a pre-construction walk. I may, um, I may take some photos, things like that of the job and get my PM and my crew lead some insight on it. But I'm, I'm really not on the jobs as much. And that's because I've invested in these guys. And sure. I put my trust in them. And that was a hard thing. I was going to say, that's the that hardest hard. part is wanting to release it. You know, you want to yeah. be there all the time. You want to have something because you want, I want to make sure they're doing it right. Or they, you know, you know, you're always worried about, I always tell people, you're always worried about that one staple that they might drive too hard. And I'm not that's there right. to see it, you know, but you, you got to, you got to let it go. If you're going to grow at some yeah. point, you've got to take off the tools because you're not making money. If you're still turning the wrench, if you're still turning the screwdriver, once you get to a certain point to really monetize it out in your company, you're going to have to to, to to get into the administrative part of it. Whereas you're doing the bidding, you're doing the discussions and pricing, all that kind of stuff. You know, and it's not to take anything away from the one man and two man shows because, you know, God bless them. We, we, you know, they're out there struggling day in and day out to make a living and that's great. But there are people out there that it's aspire to be at a higher level, right? They aspire to be four trucks, five trucks, you know, and some people don't want that headache because it can be a headache with the insurances and the liabilities. And the, But at the end of the day, it can reap some good rewards too, you know. But so it sounds like you keep that distance, but you're, you're there for them, and that's, in, that's important. Yeah, and I, I, I like my guys, man. I'm, I'm – I, I can probably call them coworkers slash friends, and maybe that's a downfall on my part. And I think as as I continue to grow into uh, the business growing, I'm starting to see myself having to separate because now we've invested in these apprentices because it was myself and my PM, Chris Westfall, who's an RW. So he would take a crew and I would take a crew. And we did this for two years. And now those apprentices that we brought up from the bottom level – now they're RWs. So so we, we invest within our system. It's like the next man up system that we do. The um, only advice I'd give somebody young like yourself that has businesses, you will get to the point where it, you just you will have a, a defined separation between your role and their role. And it, it, it will only enhance your image to them as you step into this role. And so your decisions are going to be more – non-friend based but more business oriented administrative oriented and how you direct it and things like that and so that's what i usually work a lot with business owners who they seem to struggle with that and they do get taken advantage of and it's you know you don't have to be a uh, an a-hole i like to say and and how you administer your your stuff but you, you do need to know there's a there's a line that has to separate the two okay so cool so we kind of talked again. Probably don't need to rehash that, except for the fact that it seems like uh, Wired Up Electrical Design is very open to let people come in and uh, you know start out whether they have no experience at all or come in with some experience. It's always the better if they got a little knowledge and they're willing to come to work there. You can build on that. But I like the thought that somebody you know take a young person who. Maybe they just don't know the direction, you know. They don't. They don't have direction, you know. And I think it's awesome that a company could probably take in a, a, a young person like that. Who, look, man, today some of them don't see a future. It's bleak for them. They don't go to school. Again, college. I've been there. Overrated. Okay, you end up still paying forever. And they come out of college and they're not even making what an electrician makes. So at the end of the day, you can get into this trade. And I tell them, telling you out there, you can get into this trade young, learn the most amazing trade there is, the skills. We are the keepers of the light, okay? We are the people that keep the power flowing, okay? Everything else revolves around us. Boy, that sounds impressive. Right, you're preaching, man. I'm getting preaching. it. I'm like, go. You know? 
Yeah, I mean, that's what we do. Okay? The lights don't come on without us. Okay? All right. If you mess with water and you mix it with us, you die. So, you know, hey. So, at the end of the day, there is no more, I think of it as a more noble skill uh, dating back. You know, we have, we, we walk on great shoulders. Tesla, Thomas Edison's, you know, all those type of, uh, these are the people that started all this. Uh, Mr. Ohm, okay, get all these different people that started the concept of electricity. Benjamin Franklin, who was a mason, by the way. So, yeah, all of this type of stuff helped build on this, and we just, as electricians, get to keep it going. It's amazing. But where else can you start up and eventually own your own company without having to have a college degree? Without, you know, because, again, they force that down your throat. You have so many opportunities to be the lead guy. Maybe you don't want the responsibility of being a building a business owner, but maybe you want to be the lead lead crew guy. And and you get taken care of well because I'm pretty sure that Jay, as way as I used to do, Bobby, I will take care of people that take care of me. Right. You take care of me, you take care of the company, you have a vested interest in caring about this company. Treat it and I always used to tell people, I treat a company like it's my company. Yes. And if you do that, you can't never go wrong, okay? So if you come to the moment where you become that cancer in the company, it's time to move on. You need to leave because nobody needs to be unhappy. You, you obviously be unhappy, and you're going to make the owner unhappy. It's something ain't going to work out right. Now, how are you going to use that as a reference on your next job? You're not. So anyway, so I think it's great. You let people get their foot in the door and uh, – and start a career, and the next thing you know, you know they're being rewarded for it. And the next thing you know, they could be the next wired up electrical design 2.0. That's right. Yeah, 2.0. As long as I get my cut on it. Um, you know they're gonna have to change oh. the oh, sorry. Have to change the name or something. Then they don't want to <laughs> give no money up, man. So all right, so that's well, kind of that topic for those other apprentices though that that are trying to look for a way in. Is you can you can go through your schooling your trade schooling um, outfits that are probably local. You might have one or two of them. Just go online, Google them, electrical trade schools yeah. near me, contact there's them. I, the ICs, get on a higher list. There's, yeah. you know, there, and of course we could have a whole nother show based on union and non-union and NECAs and, and IBWs and all this kind of stuff, which offer great, depending on where you're at, great, great, great opportunities stuff. to learn this trade. And stick learn with some it. amazing stick things. With one or the other. If, if you're going to go union, stick union. If you're going to go non-union, try to stick non-union and be faithful to that path. Um, I've, I've crossed them. And on the on the episode that we do the non-union union, I'll get into that. Okay. Um, but again, co- uh, call people. Go on Craigslist. Um, Craigslist, you can if, – if you look at their description of what they're looking for, you can see the professionalism in their wording. You sure. can see what they're offering and what they're not offering. So if you can do that, or you can just call companies up, call them, direct call them. Hey, can I talk to the hiring manager? Can sure. I talk to someone who takes care of, because a lot of times you're going to get the receptionist. Right. You call the ladies on the phone. Hey, how can I help you? Say, hey, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> can you, can you help me out with this? And, and they'll, they'll direct you to probably to a website where you can fill it out. Or you may just say, Hey, can I come in? And that's, right. and that's the initiative of a really good apprentice. Can I come in and talk to somebody? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm heading down right now. How serious you know, are you committed? That's that's important because I think today, if I was starting out today in all this web everything today and everything, I would probably, if I really wanted a job, I'd go down to the, I'd come down to Wired Up Electrical Design LLC, and I'd go up here and knock on that door, and I'd walk in and say, I want to be an electrician. I'm looking for a job, and I will work hard for you. Can I meet with the person that does the hiring? And, I mean, initiative. I have so many people today that say, go just fill out an online. I call up and they say, fill out an online thing. And you never know what happens, right? Exactly. Well, with me, I'm just going to go, I'm just gonna go to the, the location or, or one, of the, one, of the, uh, you know, one of the company's uh, addresses. And I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to be persistent. If you want a job, yes. be persistent. Call them. Keep calling them. Bugging them. You're going to hire me one way or the other. (laughs) Yeah. So 
How much do you really allow your electricians to tackle? When bef- when does how long does it before you really let them branch out and just kind of yeah, do, or do you ever with your apprentices? Uh, I did it pieces. I would give them a bedroom or I'd give them a project. We did commercial project. I would give them a layout of the raceway after I show, and I'd say here to here. This is all I want you to do. You come to me when it's done or come to your lead or whoever it is. I would give them projects, but uh, we had to build to that point before I would give projects. First of all, I, like I told you, I would be testing them a little bit. I'd see what they retain and things. But certain points, when do you, when, when do you actually allow your apprentices to actually start tackling things? Just like turn to your apprentice or your lead turns to the apprentice and says, go wire that room or whatever. When do you get that confidence? After their probation period or what? No, I really think it just depends on the apprentice himself. So we, we stick to the basic concept of giving one task at a time. Okay. And so the task might be going into room, six foot, 12 foot um, rule for boxing down low. So they do that. They get the basic concept. And then you start saying, okay, well, what about a bed? I know you have them laid out. And sometimes I'll let them kind of lay it out knowing that they're putting them in the wrong place just so they can learn how to take a box off, reset those nails, and then figure out their next location and, and nail it back on. And because, again, they some people want to be perfect all the time. But anyway, so I give them the room. They go in. They look at it. They get comfortable. They wire it up. Then we start. I'll have someone do all home runs. So maybe my second guy in charge will do the home runs while my main guy is hooking up the, the sub feed or doing the demo in a basement. Again, I'm just referring to basements majority. Sure. So – as as a as a new apprentice, he's still boxing out. He's going from that home run box to receptacle two, three, four, five, and then the EOC. When they're done, my guy, my crew lead will go back, walk it with them, go to every box, pull out their wiring, make sure the grounds are long enough that they're crimped, make sure the wire is long enough, tuck it back in, and we give them simple tasks and and we make sure that they fix it. Okay, hey, you're missing a staple here. Go ahead and go ahead and put one on, and this is the reason why, and, and get into why. And then when they start coming back quicker and quicker and quicker, that's when I start telling them, okay, now I'm going to give you two tasks. I'm going to have you okay. now do the room and bring a home run. And so, so it's really based upon sure. how quick that apprentice is catching on. Okay. That's, well, that's good. I was going to say that you can tell when they start getting it, that they have the aptitude for it. And you, know, and you can tell when the ones that are just standing there with their hands in their pocket who don't want to jump in. And they're like, yeah, that was probably not going to work out. No, go grab the broom. Go grab the broom. Somebody still needs to clean it. We <laughs> still need a cleaner. Which, 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 you know, which ain't a real topic today, but a lot of people have sent me this before and asked me, and I think I've talked about this on a podcast before, is did I clean my site every night if you, after you drilled holes and you had the wood chips everywhere? And, of course, I don't know how many homes, full homes y'all do. Um, I, I mean, we did used to do a lot of big homes. One of my policies before the guys would leave at the end of the night, they would they would stop thirty minutes before the end of the day, and I would have they would have to clean up the site because I did not want owners, I did not want subcontractors, I didn't want other people coming on that and and walk on and, and walk into my mess. So I was big on cleaning up the job before you left, and if it meant you were going to be a little late. It's okay. Just clock it. I'll pay for it. That's fine. But I needed my job sites to be clean. And that was always the apprentices or helper's role is to, you know, you know, I, I don't know that I want to pay a, a $40 or whatever, you know, I'm paying at the time more to me than that because I have to match insurances and all. But at the end of the day, I don't have a master doing that if I've got apprentices there that I can say, hey, 30 minutes before the end of the day, that master might be doing something critical, maybe cutting into the panel or, or doing something. You know to start, pick up the broom and start cleaning up the project so that it looks presentable, so that you start the next day fresh. Some people, believe it or not, I got a lot of a lot of pushback from that. They're like, that ain't my job. Or and I'm like, you made the mess. You clean the mess. Simple, yep. you know. That was Johnny's spot. <laughs> that was Johnny's area. A good, oh, yeah. a good crew lead will will do a final walk too, you know, because they're getting their counts, they're getting their their material count for tomorrow, calling it into the supply house to where they're going to go pick it up after the 
after the day or, or in the beginning of the day. So, you know, you may leave ladder spinners, um, not so much wire. You never know who's going to be in there unless you're going to be in there bright and early. Um, tools I always put on the van. So I, I might leave ladders and spinners and maybe some wire to let the apprentices get going if, if my crew lead is maybe has to stop at the supply house at 7. Or I may even have a apprentice stop at the supply house at 7 and grab that material so my crew lead is on site rocking and rolling. So, yeah, we, we love clean sites. A safe a safe work site is is what we need. And for you apprentices that are just getting started, I, I know you're ambitious. I know you want to get in there and you want to – you want to wire that whole place in 30 minutes. But realistically, what you can do is actually cause a unsafe environment, not only for yourself, but for other guys around you, whether it's your own trade or whether it's other trades, because you're trying to swing that ladder and run up and down a stair with it. And now you trip and fall. And, and now we got to do a um, you know workman's comp on you, which is fine if, if, if it's a legitimate reason, but right. you don't have to be go 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 all the time that the speed will come just right. just be the sponge that uh that paul talks about soak up that that knowledge that those guys are giving to you and that again the speed will come and don't be afraid to jump in when the you know the journeyman or the master or whatnot says you want to try this be eager say heck yeah, yeah. And, and, and do it you know so that type of thing um do you- do you let your guys get into panels, How, or, or do when when do you let them get into like maybe not a live panel because I know you don't do live work. Well, but maybe a we you know, we we're not we we, we we talk about that right. We're not supposed to do live work. Safety, folks. Safety. Right. Um. No, typically, be honest with you, it it takes a uh, that is probably you touched on an area where it's probably where I'm more critical in my company. The, the lead person of the master always did the panel. Mm. Always finished out. Now, use it as a teaching moment for the apprentices. And they might get to a certain certain point, but most of the panels and the stuff we did, I, I always wanted that. Because there's other stuff that could be done on site. When it was time for the panels to be trimmed out and things like that, I, I always wanted the lead guy to do it. And it was just uh, because of the labeling and everything that, that, that we needed done. And I was a real sticker, obviously, for the grounding and bonding and everything that gets done. And it, it's just that. So, I, yeah, I never had any apprentices that I assigned that to. Uh, but uh, it's some really good journeymen. So every state's different. Like your state, I don't know if they have journeymen. They have – or maybe they have journeymen. I don't uh, – maybe I'm thinking of Ohio. Um, there's, there's, a, there's apprentices, and then it jumps right into electrical contractor. Um, Virginia oh. – there was journeymen's, there was helpers, they weren't licensed, journeymen's and masters. There were some real good journeymen's, I would, you know, they would, my real good journeymen's, I would let them do the panels, trim out. Uh, not always, not always the master. So in Virginia, you only had to have one master, and that was the owner. You can have journeymen's all the time. So um, Texas is a little different what they want on job sites. Um, but real good journeymen. I'd let them. I'd let them do the panel, uh, but mainly whoever I assigned to that job, uh, as the, as the lead was the one who I ultimately wanted them to do the panel. Gotcha. So now, if I ever got it a real exceptional apprentice, then I fro- you know he, I, I now no I don't think I ever <laughs> let them do it by themselves. Sorry, <laughs> I don't, not that they couldn't, but I just. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is. Jay, do you build leaders or do you let leaders emerge? If you see an apprentice, do you target somebody that early that's really taking initiative? It seems like they're really picking things up, that they're really a go-getter. They, they really, you know, they, they realize, you know, because it's hard for a young person. I'm not going to say that all apprentices are young persons, but it's hard today to have somebody be dedicated. Now, when I was 16 years old, I was dedicated. While kids were going summers, I was taking night classes in code and things like that back at 16, which is why I wasn't always the, the you know, the, 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 how do I say it, Jay? I wasn't always the pick of the ladies. The ladies man. I was not a ladies man. I was always dealing with electrical. Anybody from my high school will tell you, 
It was electrical 24-7, whether I was competing in what we used to call VICA, uh, and, uh, or we were competing in electrical wiring competitions. I was having, now today they would call it the ideal wire, that, that competition they have now. That oh, everybody, yeah. But that I was awesome. in, in those things when I was there, and I ended up winning the national championship on that, so. that my, in my 11th grade year. So at the end of the day, I won local, won regional, and won state. And then win one national in, in my area. And so I was always into wiring, always into electrical. And so if you run across, let's, so let's say you get a young Jay Grundberg who comes to work for you that's really looks like that's somebody that you're like, you know, do you foster that, per, do you foster that person? Or do you just say, I'm going to wait and let him emerge as a leader? Do you wait to see if that person has leader qualities that come out of them, uh, which can early on not be so leadership driven because it could be talking back to the master or to the journeyman and, and being what we said, don't do, hush up. And so what do, you, do you identify somebody like that? Do you take them to the side and say, look, I believe in you. I believe in you got the ability. You need to respect the people that's teaching you but I think you can be a leader, show me, or do you just let them emerge? I just let them emerge. I I, I kind of bring them in and we talk about, again, I bring all my guys in, try to give them the ground up for six months to a year, about a year or less. I don't really like to bring in apprentices that have more than a year experience just because they have created their own opinions and they try to recreate our system. So, (laughs) but there is, you know, if you have five guys or four, whatever it is, and that one guy stands out, I may, if I'm going out myself to go do a job, I may snag him for the day. I may say, give me Jameson. That's one of my guys. I say, give me Jameson. What are you doing? Oh, we're just going to go put some uh, PVC pipe in the ground. Probably something I could do myself. Sure. But I say, give me him. I, I, I want to I wanna l- see what he does, teach him the ways – that I do it, kind of give them some insight on, on how the boss man does it, as, as they would say, and and kind of train him up that way. But as far as taking him off to the side and giving him any pep top that I wouldn't give anybody else, no. Because I, I think then you create a person who may be three to six months in the trade thinking now that they've had that talk that now they're a little bit above mm-hmm. maybe that next guy up, you know. And we don't ever want to think that they're better than that next guy up. But if that next guy up, falls off or comes in drunk and and I have to let him go or, or something like that, then I will expect and talk to that, that guy, that next guy up and go, hey, do you, do you think you can fill those shoes? Because I, I can see it in you. you know. And, and a lot of times yeah. I can with our guys. I can see it. Um, but, yeah, that's, so, I just let so it I, I do it kind of – it was kind of similar except for the way that I would do it if I saw there was only a couple occasions and they ended up going on and owning their own companies and doing really well. I remember seeing them early on coming to work with us. And, you know, again, I was almost like giving free education all the time. So it's a learning experience for them. They gain that knowledge. They work for me, did great work. And, but I would notice something in one or two of them. And I, I wouldn't go to them because I don't want to alienate anybody else. But what I would do is I would give them certain tasks to build their confidence and help them. And I might tell them, you know, I would do little things. And I would say on a project, for example, I might say a a younger apprentice that's been there for a little while, but they're starting to really show a lot of promise. I might go to them because to be honest with you, it wasn't like you had 50 apprentices fighting over it. Like you have on a, on a commercial project, right? Wasn't that big of a company, but I'd have masters and I have journeymen's and they're already getting their pay. They're not concerned about it. They don't feel any, competition and I might have an apprentice or something I'd say oh you know what on this house right now I've got a big task for you this house has six bedrooms and you're in charge of these six bedrooms that's a big responsibility oh yeah you know I would build that up for him I would say because to me it's okay it's it's, it's six six home runs potentially and looping around the room and picking up your lighting and that type of thing but I would build it up as a task to build the confidence for those that I, you know, that I did. If it was just an apprentice, I didn't feel like that they were, they really were that 
potential, then they just would help the electricians. I mean, they would just do their normal thing. But occasionally, I'd get a, a, a helper or an apprentice that was working with a, a journeyman or one of my journeymen or one of the masters, and they knew me because I probably did it to them. I would go to them and say, hey, I got six bedrooms in this house. Tell you what, they're all you. All you. You'll forever always know that this house, every time you drive by, you'll be able to tell your son someday. You'll be able to look at him and go, I wired those bedrooms. Okay? Right, those, those six. Those six bedrooms in that house where those people sleep. Okay? I wired those. Those are the safest bedrooms. Those are the safest the bedrooms. Safest. safest ever. So, I mean, again, you take an apprentice who's really eager, you know, and, and I used to have, I had two of them specifically, um, Greg and David, the different ones at different times. That literally when I told, I don't know if it was like six bedrooms, it was some task I gave them. Their eyes got big because at that point they, 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 they grabbed their tools and, and they learned from us. They grabbed, they had their tools. They grabbed, they grabbed the drill. They just went. And you can't hardly screw anything up in a house. I mean, let's, let's be real. If I, if I give you five, six bedrooms and I'm going to check it after it's done, you know, It'll stand out. If you're too close to the edge, you get a bit of nail plate, you're going to get a talking to and explain you didn't need to do that. You need to stay an inch and a quarter away from the edge from the board hole to the edge of the framing member. Learn it. Okay? 300.4. Get it. All right? That was hard to work with because I started throwing that crap all over the place. And then, Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I'd write it on the wall. I had a Sharpie. I'd go in the room and, and I'd write 300.4. And I'd say, remember it. No, I wasn't that. Boy, Jay, this whole episode is going to sound like I'm just the grumpiest evil old man. Oh, I know it. We have to do it. this over again. I might actually sound get some awful. guys to, to join my side now. I might actually get the the crowd to shift my way because last episode it shifted yours, and I'm, I'm trying to get the guys to come over to my side. <laughs> come on, Co Strong, you know? Yeah, yeah. well. It's anyway. not going to happen. It's no, not going to happen. happen. I'm the co host. That's the old guy. So. At the end, at the it, it, no old guy references tonight. It's pretty good. Not tonight. Um, yeah, so you, you you haven't done any, so that's good. So at the at the end of the day, that's what I would do to kind of build. But I would see that in somebody, and I would work on them building their confidence. Because people can't, you know, it's just talking to the mentors and people out there. You cannot, I don't believe you're born a leader. I believe that anybody has an innate within them to be a leader. But I believe in some portions of it, they, they turn it off or they subdue it or they are too afraid. They don't have the, the drive. There's things in you that change it, okay? Um, I think one of the greatest men ever that, that, that lived was, uh, to, in my mind, again, people can agree, and it's not getting political, Jay, is George Washington. George Washington became a great leader. He wasn't born a great leader. If you look at the history of the battles, he wasn't always a winner in battles that were underneath before he became president. Okay? When he became president, he became a great leader because he stepped up. And I think everybody has within themselves to be great leaders. It's just that you have things that block you. You don't have the confidence you don't have the skills. You're not willing to learn the skills. Things hold you back. Um, and so there's so many things that uh, become vices that, that you can't step out. But I'm, I'm never, I don't believe in born leaders. Uh, you know, that old thing, they're a natural born leader. Yeah, I, I don't believe we come out of the womb going, George, that hill, you know, that type of thing. I, I think at the end of the day, leaders can be cultivated. But we can't give them a participation trophy. You only can cultivate leaders by helping them build their confidence, sure. giving them ability to gain knowledge, and letting them make decisions. And ultimately, ultimately, letting them make mistakes. Because we learn from our mistakes. No better way to learn than when you make a mistake. Okay, Just don't repeat it. That's the biggest difference, okay? So that's my philosophy on that, and I explain that to people. I'm like, so don't look down on certain people in your company and say that person's never going to be a leader because that person could be a leader if a leader 
can help that person see the potential in their self. Then you can be a leader. Okay? Some people can't see the potential in themselves. It's like they've always been told they're not good enough. They can't do this. They'll never achieve this. They're, you know, that this type of thing, that they're not smart enough or, or they didn't have, you know, this. I don't care about any of that. I think there's a the potential for leadership and leaders in everybody. I used to like to cultivate it, but it wasn't for propping them. It was for giving them tasks that built their self-esteem, their confidence, rewarding them. That's why I love training people all the time for exam prep. You know, I, I try to teach them, and I always be positive, although I'm stern, and I don't cut slack. But I truly enjoy seeing people succeed. And I think you have to have that mentality. You want to see other people. And you don't do it for selfish reasons. You have to do it for non-selfish reasons. You want to see other people achieve greater things. So oh, yeah, you know, not sure how I went down that path, but... At the end of the day, that's my philosophy on leadership. I just don't believe any. I don't believe in natural born leaders. I believe that leadership can be cultivated, uh, but think you have to remove some of the layers of that onion in order to get to the root. And, and I think everybody can uh, be a leader. And this this is a trade where you can start off at the rock bottom, come in, be taught how to do it the right way, make mistakes, but still come in the next day and. And keep going hard at it, and mm-hmm. the continuous, continuously going and and per- performing your task at a high level, and then there's there's always those stages, right? So you go from boxing to to pulling wire, to pulling mm-hmm. home runs, to to demo. I mean, there's phases to the electrical um, system. Yeah. And so once you can get that all zoned in. Then, like Paul was saying, you become that leader. You you, you kind of grow into that position, and and we'll know as as business owners if you will be a leader or not at a certain point. Like I say, maybe not within the three to six months, but after about a year and a half in my system, I should be able to send you off to a trim, and you should be able to trim it out on your own or with one other guy. Mm-hmm. Granted, there should be a licensed guy there. But you should be able to do that task on your own is, is what and, I'm saying. And it's not that we don't need followers too, okay? No. Not everybody wants to be a leader. So I'm a believer that anybody can be – anybody has the innate ability to be a leader. But there is plenty of people that have no desire to be a leader, but they're followers. And we need them too. We need followers to get the work done. But you have a leader, and the key of a good leader is to lead. And to lead by example, not lead by power. Lead by example. If if one of my guys didn't understand how to do something, I would never go, you don't know how to do that. I would grab it and do it. And I would show them. I would lead them. Okay? Don't bark at them. Lead them. Teach them. Mold them. And then that's when the potential leader will come out because they will turn and do that. To their apprentice, and that's how you cultivate a leader. Okay, I think you're a leader, Jay. <laughs> Do we got time? I, I have a story. I have a, I have a quick yeah. story. Yeah. I know. Um, so my my project manager, Chris Westfall, right now, he was. We brought him in. One of the, one and the only residential wireman that I brought in who was already licensed. So Chris shows up to this job one day, and, and we're at a residential home. And he says, boss, I can't get to this wall. I can't get the drill bit to go down because we were feeding a, a circuit for a baseboard heater. And the pitch of the roof was so tight. Oh, it was – and without cutting a six-inch hole either in the ceiling and on the wall. Big old flexi bit wouldn't work. It. Would, a flexi bit wouldn't get down it. He, he just couldn't – he couldn't get to it. And I show up in my suit. I'm suited up. I, I have a button-up suit. I have slacks on, dress suit. I was, I don't know what I was doing that day. I was maybe meeting with some general contractors or something. And he says, can, can you get over here afterwards? I said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm cruising over there. I'm I'm kind of like, oh, man, I hired this guy to do this job. I know he's solid. I know he's good. But let's, you know, maybe uh, maybe I, I could show him something here. So I'm cruising over there, and 
I get up there and I get in the attic with him. And he shows me this spot and he has this picture to this day. And I army crawl. I, I'm army crawling to that corner. And I use a little stubby bit with a uh, right angle drill. And I, and I get the stubby bit as far down as I could go. I take off the stubby bit. I put the other longer drill bit in the hole already. Put the chuck on, on the drill bit. Tighten it up and then continue to go down. And as I'm doing that, I, I think, like Paul was saying, is, is I gain the respect from sure. my crew lead to go, man, if, if, if the boss can do it, I can do it. And if he's all in, I'm going to be all in. Yeah, how do you think that would have worked out, Jay, if you had been like some owners do and were to get there and say just the same thing you were thinking in the truck? Dude, I hired you as a residential wireman. You were already licensed. I ain't going to come out here every time you have a little bit of a problem. There's owners that do that. Oh, sure. And, you know, and so, you know, rather than you, you were in your, you were dressed up and you crawled up in there. And I did that many a time for my guys is like, here, let me show you, you know, in in your same, same situation. I used to have some really ultra flexible bits and I would right angle down into uh, where I could get it down a certain depth. And it would be like a, you know, the, the, the whole hog or short stubby hog and open it up a little bit so that I could then put the flexi bit and it would bang, it would, you know, it would have something to start it. And then I would bit, drill down with that, but I, I drilled a starter hole that was larger in order to be able to get the, the other bit in there. And I had a bender and it would, a little tool and it would bend the bit. And I would just, that, that thing would almost bend like that. <laughs> and that would drill down different tight angles like that. But again, the point is, you 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 didn't get there. You didn't rag on them. You didn't give them a hard time. You like, let's do this. Let's get up in there, man. The respect that you earned there, you know. You think you you, you know people that own businesses or the owners, they think that they deserve the respect because they own the business. Uh uh-uh. uh, yeah. You got to earn it. You still have to earn it. Now, I res- generally again, like I tell people, I have a hundred percent respect for you. You have a hundred percent respect. You do something wrong, you erode that away. It's hard to win it back, right? But that's that's a respect that's a little different than trade respect that you know what you're doing. Okay, that's respect in how we treat each other, what we say to each other, what we talk. But then there's always that. Does he really know how to do certain stuff? You know does. Does he know how to troubleshoot? Or does he know how to do this stuff? He just owns his company and he, you know, that type of thing, and he doesn't really know. Well, that day you proved to him that you knew what you were doing. And you were there to help him. And so, yeah. you know, that's priceless. And it's it's been beneficial since that point moving forward. Because if, like you said, what would have happened if I would have down talked him, if I'd have came in yelling at him, hey, I pay you X amount of money, do your job mm-hmm. in front of the customer, just just being what rude. do you mean you don't know how to do this what do you mean you don't know how to do what i just did right come on yeah. what i pay you for yeah he, he he would he was such a professional that he probably would have he he probably wouldn't be with us anymore and and well, nobody wants to bad. be talked to like that right nobody yeah. deserves to be talked. no one deserves it exactly no one deserves so, it so so that that's a great example of leadership that's a you know leaders have to get their hands dirty right. they have to that's how leaders do it, right? So, again, great show, Jay. I don't have anything else. You have anything any else? Sponsors? Well, I think, do we have any? I, I seen the flash lamp, the, the, the light lamp that you have. Do you have oh. that on? Yeah. Where oh. Are you? oh, he's here oh. at the. Uh... See that thing? Look at that. I, I could have used that in the attic, actually. Yes, you could use it. Three a, LEDs. It's pretty, pretty bright. Get one of those. So that's got a. Oh, you you will. And you see, it's got the name on it. Everything on there, and of course, we got the good old screwdriver sets as well with the the eight bits in there. Again, if you're interested in that above Jay's head, you can uh, donate. And there's the address, or you can go to masterthenec.com and. Scroll to the bottom. You can see where you can donate to help keep these free episodes going. Um, and you donate it, we'll send you these, and we'll, uh, I like to say we'll pick up the tab sending it to you, but again, you're donating, so you're paying for it. But it's, a, it's you know, donation. And we appreciate every bit that can help 
continue to do that. So thanks again. And, uh, well, Joe, that's another, uh, Jay, another great episode uh, in, in the book. And uh, hopefully you all enjoyed it. Any last words you want to give to anybody out there, uh, Jay, before we uh, wrap this one up? We went a little bit about an hour and a half on this show, which is about 30 minutes longer than normal. But it was a great show. It couldn't stop. We had to talk more. Sure. So, yeah, the, the biggest advice is if you're going to make that step as an electrical apprentice, um, go two feet in. Go all in. Give, yeah. give it give it your best shot. And and if you do that, at the end of the day, you'll know if you're made for it because maybe you're not. Maybe your path is in electrical. Maybe it's a different trade or a different field of some sort. But like Paul said, it's the greatest trade you can get into. It's well worth it. You can If it's financial issues that you're having – those will pay for themselves as you grow um, and, and continue to continue to grow. So go in, become one of us. There you go. Become one of the chosen few. There right. you go. Till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless for Jay and myself. Take care. <laughs>